We've been talking about spiritual growth, three stages in the Christian's growth life. And uh, we begin in the young man stage, or I'm sorry, the ch child stage, children stage. We should progress to the young man stage, and then God expects us to go to the father stage. If I'm standing still, I'm slowly going backwards. If I'm standing still, I'm slowly going backwards. God's not pleased with us when we go backward. Now, he knows that we fail. He knows that. And aren't you glad he understands? And aren't you glad 1 John 1, 9 is in the Bible? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a great verse? What a great verse here in the book of 1 John. So I want to ask myself this question tonight, and you ask yourself this question. Where am I in these three steps? Now, we may have moved from the child stage to the young man stage, but from time to time we might revert back to that child stage in certain areas. You might have gotten to the point where you're at the father stage, but there will be times that you'll revert back again. But there should always be that continuing to move forward. Even though you may make some movement back, you learn from it and you move forward. Now, would the God would stay in the Father stage all the time. Amen? Now, I guess the question I would ask myself tonight and you, does this concern me? Does this concern me? The things that uh, we need to remember as Christians is that a lot of folk will come in here on Sunday morning and they'll sit through a service and they will walk out that back door and there's no change in their life. They didn't listen intently. They didn't come for the right reason. Uh, remember the, the song or the chorus we used to sing, Fill My Cup, Lord? And uh, I heard one preacher say, and you may have heard this, uh, he said, you know what we need to do? He said, we need to have some ushers to stand at the back of the church. And when people are coming in for the service, why, uh, he'd hold a, a cup in his hand. And he would say, have you come this morning to have your cup filled? If not, just turn around and go back. Because you're not going to learn. You're not going to progress. There's not going to be any changes. Uh, is my heart fixed on moving forward? Is your heart fixed on moving forward? I would say that age six and preached my first sermon at age 18 and I'm 74 now and I still need to go forward. I still need to grow. I've got a lot of growing to do and so do you. And so let's ask the Lord to help us to move from that child stage to the young man stage to the father stage. Now, I'm not going to be in any hurry on Wednesday evening as we look through these uh, three steps, but I'm going to also intertwine some of the other passages in 1 John and even in the book of Acts. Now, I want to begin tonight in the book of Acts chapter 2. Now, I want you to understand something. The book of Acts begins the church age. Before that, you were in the Old Testament time, Old Testament period, and so forth. The Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost to indwell believers. And that made a tremendous difference in the lives of God's people on the earth when they were actually indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Now, because the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were able then to take the gospel from where they were to the world. Remember what was said of the disciples? These that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. Let me ask you a question. Are we turning the world upside down now? Are we? I don't think we are. I, uh, I'm seeing some things that I'm wondering about. We were talking about it today, Tom and I were. They're not building churches that look like churches. They look like a store, theater, 
anything. It's almost like we don't want to look like a church. We don't want to act like a church. We don't want to do churchy things like it's been done. Well, my thought is this. If it's biblical, use it. If it's biblical, use it. If it's not biblical, don't use it. Now, if you'll study the book of Acts, you'll discover this. The disciples were all in one place and in one accord. In one place, in one accord. And they turned the world upside down. Did they have their troubles? Yes, they did. They had their problems within themselves. And they had problems as they tried to move forward. However, as they began to learn and grow and realize that the Holy Spirit lived within them and that the Holy Spirit would lead them in a path of righteousness, they would turn the world upside down. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. They could have not turned the world upside down if it was not for the Holy Spirit, of course, and if it were not for the fact that the Holy Spirit knitted them together in one accord. They loved one another. They were there for one another. And in these last days that we're living in, we need that. Now, we have a lot of fun here in our church, and I'm glad that we do. And Christians can have fun and can enjoy one another. That's, that's, that's wonderful. And, but we are here for one another. I want you to help me become a better Christian. I want to help you become a better Christian. And I hope that we all are working together to do that. Every man in this building, every woman in this building tonight, has at, if you're saved, you have at least one spiritual gift. At least one. Now that gift is not for you, it's for these other men and women. You may have several gifts. You may not come behind in any gift. You may have all the gifts. That's up to the Holy Spirit, to the gifts that you have. And so discover what your gift or gifts are and let the Holy Spirit use them to help other members in this church. Now, you can't do that without prayer, Bible study, and being together. I've said this many times before, but I want to say it again. The devil would love to get a believer out by himself. The devil would love to get a family out by itself, secluded from other Christians. You know why? Because he knows we need one another. We need that prayer time. We need that I'm praying for you. We need that I love you. We need that sweet fellowship. And by the way, I'm glad our people here fellowship together in little groups and so forth. I'm glad we do that. Now, uh, the best place is right here. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Because the scripture says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But he says this, he, see, he says, we see the day approaching. You know what he's saying? Dangerous, hard, difficult times. Dangerous, hard to deal with times are here. And we need one another. Now, I want to begin in, in Acts 2 and begin here in verse 42. And I want you to see what's said about the disciples as they are about to embark their ministry in the church age. And of course the church age will go until the rapture of the church. We're in the church age now. And I believe we're coming down to the very end of it. I really do with all of my heart. We're coming down. And of course if you, go, if you read Revelation as we'll study Revelation on Sunday evening, the book of Revelation tells us dangerous times are coming and they will be here. But these men turned the world upside down because they loved one another, they loved Jesus, and they worked together. Now look at what these verses say, beginning in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Do not minimize doctrine. 
Doctrine is teaching. Teaching. We need to teach our children doctrine. It's biblical teaching that will help them grow. And you can't grow without doctrine. Teaching. That's why we need men and women with the gift of teaching that knows how to rightly divide the word of truth. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, now watch this, and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Do I follow that pattern? Does our church follow that pattern? If we do, then we'll be able to know what our gift or gifts are and we'll be able to use them and that'll help the church to grow. Once again, are you using your gift or gifts to help the members of this church grow and to help our church grow? Always be looking for opportunities. I looked at my glasses today and one of the eyepieces here uh, was gone, just, just, just gone. And so I knew I was going to go for my wa walk in the mall. And so when I went on the walk in the mall, I turned right in to where the, uh, the glass places there where they sell uh, glasses. And I went in and I said, can you help me? And they said, oh, absolutely. And so while the young lady was uh, take, going back and taking care of that, well, I sat down and had the opportunity to witness and give out tracts. When she came back, I, and I said, how much do I owe you? And she said, oh, nothing. I said, thank you so much. And so the opportunities are there. Take advantage of the opportunities. And so at least tonight, I'll be able to lay my head on my pillow tonight and know I witnessed to somebody. And so these people were together. Would you pray that Journey Baptist Church, that our membership will be together? that we'll be together. And did you know that one member can, weep, can weaken the whole fellowship? One member can weaken the whole fellowship. Take a chain. You know the old illustration. If there's a weak link, it affects that, that whole chain, doesn't it? Because that chain will break. And there has to be repair. But notice how, what he says. They continued. Look at the word steadfastly. It wasn't a game with them. It wasn't a game with them. Time came for worship, they were there. And they didn't fuss about how long the service went. Amen? Amen. Well, boy, didn't the preacher preach a long time this morning? Didn't the song service go long this morning? I don't know who it was. Some preacher said... Uh, I only go home and to church, and so I want to have fun at both places. And so I, I know what he was saying. When we get together, let's enjoy ourselves. So we do it steadfastly. Somebody answer that. The Holy Spirit's calling you. <laughs> and <laughs> steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. I love that word fellowship and in breaking of bread. Now, the devil will do anything he can to break fellowship. Now, you, you say, well, what's the, what is this to have to do uh, with the a young man stage and so forth? It has a whole lot to do with it. It has a whole lot to do with it. Whether you are going to move to the next stage or whether you're helping someone else move to the next stage, all of this coincides together. Now, watch. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, teaching, fellowship, oneness at that's what fellowship is at oneness working together and then in breaking of bread the Lord's Supper that's a very important thing and in prayers do you have a prayer list of unsaved people that you pray for every day backslidden people people that are struggling the church do you pray every day now, because they did this continually, they turned the world upside down. Now, look at verse 43. Look at the results of what they were doing. Look at what happened. And fear came upon every soul. There's great conviction. And many wonders and signs were done 
by the apostles. Now let me stop there and just insert this. The gifts are not in operation today. The gift of tongues and those kind of things. That's, they're not in operation today. They died out with the apostles. And I'm, I can't go any deeper than that. I'm not going to say much more about that. You go to some churches and, and it's a hullabaloo and all kind of wild stuff going on that's worth nothing. And so God used these people and great fear and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. You know, I'm glad that our church does have a desire to help people that have needs. I thank the Lord for the deacons, that they have a, a heart for that. They really do. And I thank the Lord for our deacons, most of them. <clears throat> I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a smile. Okay. All right. All right. And all that believed were together and had things, all things common, sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now watch. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Now watch this. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Frankly, I'm very concerned that we've not seen anyone saved in a while. Now, I know we're living in a cold day. We're living in a cold day. People don't want to come to church. They don't want to hear what you have to say. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Monday, uh, when we were playing golf, I, I rode with some guys that I had never met before. And uh, one of them it was saved. He was one riding on the cart with me. He was saved. After we got through and we were putting everything up and getting ready to go, I was witnessing to the other two, and they didn't want to have anything to do with truth, with the gospel. Keith was visiting Saturday, and he just simply introduced himself, and the guy just slammed the door in his face. Well, that's the kind of day we're living in, and it's going to get worse and worse. But pray with me that God will help us to obey this verse and to see these things happen. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Start praying that the Lord will add to our church. And then you be involved in inviting people and giving out the gospel. Now I want you to go to 1 John 2. 1 John chapter 2. Now, if you will remember when we started out here talking about the three stages of the Christian life and three stages of the Christian growth, uh, we read these verses here in chapter 2, and I ask you to write down one word, and that word was authentic. Authentic. Are we authentic? Are we the real deal? And I gave a little, little illustration about in the days of the apostles, uh, they were potterers, and they sold their pottery. And some of that pottery was ex very expensive. I mean very expensive. But then they, they made pottery that was flawed, but some of them that were crooked, it was, looked so real that the average eye could not tell uh, that they were not what they should be. But an honest potterer would have his most important expensive stuff there and then he would have uh, the copies and then what he would do is he would put over there flawed but they were beautiful anyway and he would sell some of them but the authentic ones he put under those vases vase authentic without wax without wax. It meant this is the real deal. This is genuine through and through. Now do you know what hurts the church? Is those bowls or whatever, vase or whatever they are, they look authentic but they're not. And what we need is authentic Christians. And I think you would agree with me 
when I make up my mind that I'm going to go forward, it won't be long until old Slewfoot comes around and throws everything that he has at you. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for the leadership of our church. And by the way, I want you to pray for me. I need your prayers. I get up here on Sunday morning and I look out and I see people that I know are not saved. I see people that I know are not right with the Lord. And I want to do the best I can to let the Holy Spirit speak through me to see people saved and born again. And I want you to pray for me. But I want us to be authentic. Now, here in 1 John 2, look at verse 12, if you will. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 down through verse 14. Okay? I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Boy, just being a, a little child in the family of God is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Isn't those great verses? Great verses, aren't they? Have I come to the point in my life that I'm an overcomer? And I've come to my growth in, in grace to, uh, where I'm an overcomer. The Lord's helping me to overcome the wicked one. If you stood up tonight and gave a testimony, if I stood up tonight and gave a testimony about this, what would I say? I hope we'd all say, God's helping me to be an overcomer. Now, if you read 1 John, the book of John and 1 John, 2 John and 3 John, you'll get the idea as you, as you read it and study it, there is a family atmosphere. There's a family atmosphere. And you, of course you see that here. Little children, young men, fathers, and of course ladies are entwined in, into that also. So the Lord wants us to be authentic. And he wants us who are saved to grow and move forward. Now, how we share with one another in the family is very important. And he talks about that here in chapter 2. Now, look at chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Now, these verses are very important if we're going to progress from one stage to the other. I want to say this. At night, when I'm, my head is on my pillow and, and, I, and I'm wanting to go to sleep, but I'm praying and, and so forth and so on, I guess one thing that bothers me as a pastor is this. We try to have meetings through the year with godly men who've been through the wars. We're going to have some more of these men in to preach for us. And as pastor, it just breaks my heart that I know people that need what they're going to say and they don't even show up at all or they only show up one service out there an open target for the devil come on a Sunday morning and never come back on a Wednesday night or a Sunday night now I know people are busy I know you work you're busy but let me ask you a question. What's more important than Jesus in your life? What's more important than the Word of God? What's more important than getting together with God's people? It's 5 till 8. We'll get you out of here. Uh, about uh, right at 8 o'clock. I'll, I'll let you out. One hour. One hour. Uh, you, uh, that's not going to hurt you as far as you're getting up and going to work. And I'm using that uh, in, in a way to illustrate what I'm trying to say. And so he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. 
And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What are you saying, Brother Boofer? I'm saying he's writing here to his little children. He wants them to know that in their walk with the Lord, that there will be times of great defeat. You've experienced it, haven't you? Let me ask you this. Have you done something and the Holy Spirit just zaps you, speaks to you, and you're just overwhelmed? Why did I do that? I can't believe that I would do that. I'm an impatient person. Now, don't ask Sue to tell you anything about me. I'm just confessing. Don't, don't ask her to tell you. But I'm an impatient person. I want things done now. Now. Excuse me, may I get involved in that conversation down there? Jesse, I don't want you sitting behind my wife anymore. Sit over here with Tom so we can watch you. Uh, deacons, are you watching this? I, I need some help here. All right. <laughs> All right. Now I'm off track. All, I'm all, way off track now. Okay, but aren't you glad? Now listen, aren't you glad? You really want to serve the Lord. You really want God to use you, but you blow it bad. And I mean, sometimes we do, don't we? Aren't you glad these two verses are in the Bible? Aren't you? Look at them again. My little children, isn't that, isn't that a sweet phrase? You see it all the way through. My little children. Uh, the writer uh, uses that. And God will lead us, and, and he'll help us when we, when we blow it. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. Now, what is he saying here? Is he saying you can reach sinless perfection? No. He knows better than that. But he does want to get across to you and to me, don't let the fact that you know you're going to sin keep you from fighting with everything that you've got. One of the best things you can do is to know uh, the wiles of the devil. The Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. Is, does not it say that? Amen? We are not ignorant of his devices. Let's know what his devices are so we can combat him. And so we can go to the passages of Scripture we can use to combat him. So he says, don't have the intent to sin. Uh, fight it all the way. Uh, do everything that you need to do. But he says this. And if any man sin, we have an advocate, a daysman, a go-between, between God and the Father, for up between us and the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is a propitiation. Again, it's that go-between for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Isn't that great? Let's say I'm in the child stage, and I am get to progressing along, and I'm just almost come to the point where I've, I've arrived, if you will, if you'll put, allow me to put it that way, to the young man stage, and then you just really blow it. And then the devil, of course, will creep in. He'll say, well, that's it. It's over. That's what he'll do. It's over. And then he'll say something like that. You know, if you'll think a little bit, the pastor saw you do that. He heard you use that word. Boy, the deacons were close by when I did that. He'll do anything. He is a master deceiver. And we will try to discourage you in any way that he can. And um, then look down in verse 29, and, and we'll close with verse 29. If, you, if ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of God. Aren't you glad we can know we're of God? How do you know? Because you're going to look like your father. You're going to act like your father. 
and I'm not going to go much deeper uh, into in that. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. I, I, will, I do want to read this one. I love this. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. The word manner, behold what manner of love. That word manner actually has this idea, incredible quality. Incredible quality. Each individual, if we're saved, if we're born again, has the Holy Spirit living within. And that love that the Father has bestowed upon us, that quality that comes from God, all of these things are provided for us. So you help me pray. Pray for me and I'll pray for you that we'll take these things and put them in practice in our life. Let me close by asking you to be very careful because Satan loves to do this. He loves to get Christians where they criticize one another and have evil thoughts against one another. Well, I don't like him because, be careful, be very careful because the devil would love to split the church in any way that he can. Did Peter blow it? He did, didn't he? And yet, how God used him. All right, pray for Saturday as we visit. Pray for Sunday as we come back Sunday morning and Sunday night. Think about the church and the pastor working together. Then Sunday night, read chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, and then uh, I want you to see as we go through the book of Revelation what great things the Lord has planned for us. All right, let's stand, please, and we'll be dismissed in prayer.